Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining us to hear from Dr. Eiler. Um, as always, if you have questions that come up during Dr. Eiler's presentation, um, go ahead and put the question in the chat and he will address them at the end. Thank you, Dr. Eiler. Thanks, Vicki, and thanks everybody for making the time today to spend a little bit of that time with us on what's going on in the economy, at least from my angle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk us through what's been going on at the national level and then talk about the state and a little bit of regionality that's starting to brew up in California uh, and, and kind of conclude with some things I see as things to watch over the next 12 months. So the labor market in the United States continues to show a lot of resilience. I normally show the Great Recession briefly as a contrast, given that we went through a very severe recession when the pandemic hit and we grew out of it relatively quickly, which most economists predicted. But the continued growth of the American economy, given some of the headwinds, still remains baffling to a lot of economists, including the Federal Reserve's economists. And this is one of the reasons why the Federal Reserve did not lower interest rates in their January meeting and probably will not lower them in their March meeting. And I'll talk a little bit more about interest rates in just a bit. But this blue line represents the evolution of the total number of people working in the United States. If I index that number and start that number in November 2007 at 100, it took 78 months to get the same number of people in the United States working in total than we had just before the beginning of the Great Recession. And that long time period is why we call it the Great Recession. The evolution of the pandemic recession, recovery and expansion looks like this in the black line. If we put January 2020 in seasonally adjusted terms equal to 100, sharp cut April and May, the beginnings of coming out of it, June, July and August 2020. And then as we crept into 2021, we started to get our sea legs and we've been growing basically ever since uh, the early middle portion of spring in 2021. That 103.5 number on the far right-hand side means that we are 3.5% more people working than we had in January 2020 after seasonal adjustments. And as long as that black line continues to rise, we will likely avert a, a declared recession as the gains in labor markets should continue to provide income to homes and ultimately keep consumers spending. But as I'll talk about at the end, one of the real tricky foundational issues of how we're going to keep away from recession is how much more can we rely on consumers sort of providing buoyance for this economy? And if they start to peel back in terms of what's been, uh, what they've been spending, that could easily start to contract our economy in such a way we'll creep closer to recession. But for right now, the labor market gains continue to show good news for the American economy. On the inflation front, this measure of inflation here, which is called core personal consumption expenditures prices, uh, has been falling precipitously over the last 15 months, but af that's after rising very, very quickly uh, for the previous 18 and kind of remaining at relatively high levels. So you normally hear about maybe the consumption or the consumer price index in the news. This is another way to think about consumer prices, which is meant to be a general view of what you buy at home every month, but core means we're removing food and energy prices and, and products from that shopping cart, if you will, of what we buy at home on a monthly basis. So policymakers like to look at core prices because food and energy prices can be volatile. For example, what's happening in the Middle East can easily lead to a lot of volatility in oil prices. It can also lead to volatility in the delivery of food to different countries, which can change prices of food around the world. And so policymakers tend not to make policy decisions based on food and energy prices moving around, but how the core of the economy after we remove food and energy is moving around. And that blue solid line on this graph shows the evolution of the percentage change in those prices on an annualized basis. Where in December, the percentage change in that shopping cart you buy at home, minus food and energy products, cost 2.9% more than it did December, 2022. And that's been falling. Now there's two angles on this one. It's great that it's falling and it needs to fall through those red dots that I'm gonna shade now. That's the current prediction of the Federal Reserve. And as long as they're doing their work, they're going to be able to start lowering rates in the middle portion of this year. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, too. Under the supposition that we are able to keep guiding that blue solid line through those red dots toward that blue dotted line, which is basically where the Federal Reserve wants inflation to be. The trick is, is that even with falling inflation, the recent inflation over the last almost three years now is, is going to start to compound on households. And so this is while falling still compounding from previous year's inflation. So prices have gone up and we should not expect 
some wild contraction of prices to take us back to the same levels we were before the pandemic anytime soon or at all. But what that means is we should see, continue to see slower movements in inflation, not necessarily lower prices, but a slower evolution of those prices upward. And we should see interest rates falling basically somewhere between three quarters of a percent and one and a quarter percent by the end of this year. There's a lot of shell gaming and consternation and hand waving and crystal ball gazing around what's going to happen with interest rates and financial markets have kind of bet on rates falling faster and more and sooner than they look like they're going to. The main idea is to think if we don't continue to see inflation fall and we kind of need to see labor markets flatten a little bit because the Federal Reserve is going to be thinking that labor markets continuing to grow means there's going to be underlying pressure on inflation, which means we might have this sort of plateau effect as we're falling down with that blue solid line and not quite get to the goal, which is the blue, so blue dotted line. That'll tell some of the tale of how fast and how far down rates go. Now, if we look at rates, this is a long-term view of interest rates because interest rates will be probably a major focus of most of the economic news in 2024 as we're not only creeping up on the presidential election, but sort of sifting through whether or not we are in fact going to have a slower moving economy and perhaps move so slowly we have to declare a recession. If you look at the difference between what 10-year government debt and three-month government debt pays, that is a way to proxy the difference between what lenders make for one more dollar they lend, the 10-year treasury security rate, and what they have to pay to bring in deposits, the three-month treasury rate. That difference is kind of like profitability in banking, which means it kind of tells us tells a tale of how available credit will be. So when the blue line is rising above zero, credit tends to be a little bit more available. When, blue, when the blue line is going below zero, credit markets are a little bit more seized up in terms of providing credit easily because they're concerned about the profitability of that next dollar lent out and also how they use another dollar that comes in in deposits. You can see on the far right-hand side, that blue line has been below zero now for almost, uh, well, beyond one year, almost two years now. And it has been sort of, you know, trying to find its way back to zero because market forces want to push it back to zero at some point, but it's struggling to get there. This is the Federal Reserve's rates. So last week, the Federal Reserve decided not to change rates. The, the movement of rates has this sort of very nice cyclic movement over time, generally speaking. And you can see on the far right hand side how quickly that's gone up. And one of the main reasons why that blue line has sunk below zero is how fast the Federal Reserve increased rates and have kept them there. And that pressure on short term rates remains in the market, which really means the, the pressure on cost of funds for banks. So a related issue with how interest rates are going to move around this year in terms of the economic news may very well be what happens in banking, credit unions, and savings banks in terms of their availability of deposits and how willing or not willing they are to lend. That could easily slow our economy down if there's any kind of weird credit crunch or we hear about more banks failing or more mergers and acquisitions in banking because certain banks are not able to remain profitable. So what I want to do now is I want to show you a forecast of the American economy uh, which is from November, but is basically the latest uh, summary of information we have. The, the IMF came out with their latest forecast uh, in the last 10 days. And when they came out, that pretty much is this forecast. It's really not that, that different than this in terms of the American economy. Every quarter, the Philadelphia Federal Reserve interviews 40 people that all those people do is watch what's going on in the American economy professionally. They're all forecasters. That, that's all they do for a job. And three pieces of information I pull from that are what's going on with re the change in percentage terms of real income or inflation adjusted gross domestic product and how they see it over the next few years. What's happening with unemployment rates is one metric, not a great metric, but one metric that people tend to look at with respect to labor markets. And then that same core PCE inflation rate we saw before. So the latest forecast shows that we've seen an increase in the prediction of what's going to happen as, as 2023 ended. Now that 2023 has ended and we've had our first uh, estimate of what happened in the fourth quarter of 2023, it's a little bit better than the 2.4, not by much, but basically right on where they expected, which is good. 1.7 this year is up from what it was the previous quarter. So the qu column right next door to the left is what was true or what was their forecast one quarter ago. The shaded column is what their current forecast is. And you can see in 2025, it's going to be a little slower. And then 2026 picks back up again. But the bottom line is, is that 
forecasters generally believe that we are going to kind of slow move through this year and maybe the beginning of next. Part of that is because of geopolitical issues, domestic political issues, and uncertainty in the presidential election and in a broad range of other elections that are happening. And ultimately, though, we are not currently predicting recession. So when you hear about things like soft landings, when you hear about what the uh, the outcomes of the labor market are going to be, a lot of that is baffling economists in the sense that we figured with higher interest rates and continued relatively high inflation, we would have more downward pressure on the economy, specifically in hiring. That has not quite happened yet. Part of that could be that we've had a structural change in the labor force and that businesses are still trying to recover from the pandemic and they still need to hire to full, fulfill that recovery. And they're continuing to hire because they're still building up to get back to where they were four years ago. Unemployment rates look like they're going to inch up very slowly. This is another indicator that there's a lot of labor demand versus supply out there. And how labor supply evolves over the next few years is a huge workforce development challenge. Uh, and we have to watch very closely how people start drifting back in toward the labor force and how productive those folks are on the margin when they come back. Do we see people who maybe made a rash decision to retire and then three or four years later come back because they're attracted by the higher wages? And what's that really going to do for productivity in the United States? Those are kind of the ways you should think about the labor market, not just the unemployment rate on its own, but think more completely about how labor is productive and ultimately how many people are working total in the United States and in what industries. That core PC inflation is the same red dots we saw before, and so that is drifting down toward 2026. And the bottom line is, is we have had a very resilient economy over the last two years. We have not had a repeat recession. Last year, consistently baffled economists in terms of how fast the growth rate was uh, in versus predictions, and forecasters have been constantly shifting their look to a more optimistic versus pessimistic, pessimistic one, specifically as 2023 closed and starting to look forward to 24 and 25. Now, we shift now to the state level, and what I'm going to show you is three different perspectives on labor markets in California. So the first one is the number of people that live in California and either have a job or what we, an economist would call actively seeking work. And that defines them as unemployed, meaning that they're not employed, but they are actually on the market looking for a job. And this blue line represents that sort of slow evolution from January 2010 forward, the relatively sharp cut in uh, when the pandemic began the sort of wobbling effect coming out of the pandemic and then the slow evolution up to basically where we are today, which is not back to the same number of people in the California labor force than we had in December 2019 or in January 2020, right at the sort of pivot point where it was obvious we were going to go into some kind of socially decided upon recession as a result of slowing down what we were doing outside the house. This is the number of people working in California that live in California. So this is residential employment. Now, generally speaking, I don't, I have not historically made that distinction, but the next uh, the graph I put up here or the next line I put up here will tell you why I'm making that distinction. This is people that live in California and have a job regardless of who they work for around the world. You can see that sort of similar evolution where the gap between these two is the unemployment rate in California as, as reported by California EDD. There was a shock down which is relatively obvious. You can see where the pandemic recession hit. And then we came out of it pretty well, but that growth stopped in about the middle of 2022. And part of that was because when interest rates increased and we saw financial markets uh, sift around looking for a solution, we saw a slowdown in hiring in California. And we also started to see slowdown for what who Californians that work outside of California, the types of jobs they had. And we now have seen basically a flat labor force change. And these are all seasonally adjusted. And we have really had not much change in the number of people who live in California and have a job over the last 18 months, which is a rare event for the California economy. You can see how weird it looks, just sort of this low, slow, flat line. Well, if you look at for the people who work for California-based employers, which is the black line, that line has continued to grow, has exceeded where we were before the pandemic, and is much more aligned with what we've seen at the national level. So there's this sort of baffling issue in California is who are California employers hiring? The supposition is they're hiring people who live outside California primarily because that's where they're finding a workforce and that remote work continues to be a part of our everyday lives in California. And the California-based labor force is shifting a little bit and perhaps we're, we're losing people as I'll show you later and they're leaving the state 
And people who were living in California who would have been counted in the pre-pandemic numbers now live in Tennessee, still work for the California-based employer, but are in Tennessee's labor force. If we look at the act or the forecasted level of employment going forward, and this is for people who work for California-based employers, this accompanies the governor's budget and comes out of the Department of Finance. It looks like this from 2010 forward on an annualized basis. So when I annualize the data, the last graph were monthly data seasonally adjusted. You can see the run-up after 2010, the sharp cut, then the evolution out, and the continued growth would looks like to be maybe about 10 or 11% above where we were at the end of 2019. The index on this one is for 2019 uh, as a pre-pandemic benchmark. And the green area here is the forecasted portion. Uh, and you can see how that is just going to, looks like it's going to grow at increasing and in, at a decreasing rate, but still going up over the next few years. So this graph also suggests that from a forecast standpoint, we don't expect the California economy to recess alone vis-a-vis the U.S. economy, uh, and we also expect that some of the pessim or some of the optimism that's in the American economy's forecast is driven by the continued growth of hiring inside of California. But the previous slide is a little bit more baffling in terms of how is it that California's employment of those that live in California has sort of flattened while California jobs have continued to rise? It's got to be that we're hiring from outside. If we look across California as of December 2023, and these data are through the end of the year, basically. I'm gonna show you now a bunch of different sort of regional looks. That's what's happened with jobs growth over the last year and also since the, uh, right before the pandemic, thinking again, the end of 2019 as one pre-pandemic benchmark. This is what happened last year. So these are all really good numbers in a year where in 2022, we were thinking 2023 was gonna be a slower year. We had jobs growth across almost every single major area in California. The only two that were a little bit lower were Shasta and Merced. But otherwise, we had other, other places across the Central Valley, the North State, the coastal areas that all basically grew. And you can see places like Monterey, Santa Barbara, Sonoma County, Sacra Sacramento sort of metro area all grew relatively robustly, somewhere around 3%, which was slightly faster than the US. Uh, but we also had other ones that were more slow growing. But this all is good. Now, if we look at this compared to where we were before the pandemic. So the black columns tell you whether or not the local labor markets in these regions have actually recovered the number of workers that were working before the pandemic. Marin County, Butte County, and Santa Cruz counties have not quite yet got back to the same level of hiring we were at before the pandemic. So growth has continued. It has been slower in some areas than others, but there are still some counties or some regional areas in California that have that shadow effect of the contraction that took place from the pandemic still over them. If we swing to housing now, this is a look at what's happened over the last year in housing prices at the median. So these data come from Zillow's public database, and it's really a very robust database. Uh, but the bottom line is, is this is what happened last year, and you can see the growth was relatively tepid, if you will. There was a, a sort of a mixed bag of negative and positive outcomes. The larger markets in California seem to be relatively resilient. Some of the smaller markets, as you move left to right, it basically goes from large to small. And I show you some sort of Northern California here against some of the more coastal areas and then the larger metro areas, kind of a mixed bag. But if you look at the three-year run, much more complete growth, even with a contraction in some of these areas, positive over the three years and over four years, very positive for most areas. So again, even with last year's sort of uh, mixed bag outcomes in housing markets, the returns on housing since basically the end of December or the end of 2019, when we've had this wild run up in housing prices, if you're a homeowner, it you've still made very good gains, even though last year was a little bit flat. If you're looking forward, this is another look at California's uh, uh, different parts of California in terms of what next or this year may bring. Uh, relatively mixed again, but not too bad in the sense that if you think of a year in which we still have relatively high interest rates, we have some threats of maybe a slower economy and job losses that are that should be coming, it's still relatively good in terms of not a wild contraction. So we have we have walked through this time of very quickly high, rising house prices without having a real threat of a quick contraction a la what we saw 2007, 8, and 9. 
it looks for now that the credit market conditions, the housing market conditions, and the labor market conditions all in unison do not suggest we're going to have a wild contraction in prices anytime soon. But some areas will probably be a little bit flatter than others. You can see those in the last graph, which I kind of moved quickly through because we, were, we are on limited time. San Francisco County, city and county, has had lower home prices since the pandemic began. Still predicted to have lower again this year. You can kind of see it fifth from the right here on this graph as one sort of standout region or space in California that really has not had the same housing market gains as other places in California. But places like Mendocino County, Humboldt County have orig or originally saw rises in prices and they've actually seen a slide back over the last 12 or 18 months. So be watching very closely what happens with home sales and your local labor markets, that will tell most of the tale. If we look at population change, this kind of harkens back to what I talked about earlier when I talked about labor force. This is the evolution of births, deaths, the inbounds for, of foreign uh, residents that we send people from California away to other parts of the world and other parts of the world come to us. And then the net domestic change, meaning other parts of the United States in net. So this is births, then death, then net foreign inbounds. We tend to attract the world versus take push Californians toward other places around the world. And then movements around the United States, which have surged in the last few years. And California's population over the last three fiscal years has basically dropped as a result of two items. One, the downward trend you can see from about 2010 through 2019 had already started to get lower and slower and slower growth. A lot of that uh, is resting on the uh, doorstep of higher home prices and just a higher cost of living in California. At least that's how most economists and demographers feel like is an easy way to explain why that slow growth got slower and slower and slower. And then the pandemic just just hammered that home. But we have seen it climb back up. So people are coming back to California. There are people who are having, they're seeing a little bit of a pickup in birth rates. Uh, the number of people who have passed on is slowing down because we had another, we had a surge. You can see that red column, unfortunately, is representative of what happened during COVID. Bottom line is, is that California is slowly getting people back. So that's why when you see that, that prediction of jobs over the next few years, the supposition is we will attract the world back to California in terms of labor force. We will see if that all plays out. But those three years of lost population is the, are the first three years in recorded history for California that, in fact, we've lost population. Now, if you look forward, there's also another weird piece of data that's out there. This is the evolution of the California population in terms of the current demography forecast through 2060. So you can see in the beginning, we start with the population that was estimated in 2020, we're, we're gonna, likely to get back to that same population level in, let's like, say, the late 2020s, early 2030s. But then that's going to flatten out in the 2040s and 50s and go right back basically to where we started in 2020 in 2060. So right now, demographers at the Department of Finance and in, in the state government are suggesting we will not see any population growth basically over 40 years in California, which is what I saw this, I just blew my mind. But it suggests that we're having this this sort of you know long term population shift to an older population, which means lower birth rates, which means probably less demand for housing in some ways, or a shift in demand for housing, and we're not going to have a lot of new people coming to California because the space may not be available in terms of the housing market not providing housing, and the jobs will kind of flatten out to a certain place. But it, it's still hard for me to imagine that we'll have about 40 million people in California 40 years from now, rather than maybe another 10 or 15 million. But that may be good news to a lot of people on this call. This is the North State. So if you take the 12 counties that basically lie north of Yuba and Sutter counties toward the Oregon border and then swing around uh, to Trinity County, those, those counties have lost population. It looks like it's going to continue to stay below uh, below the 2020 level to about the mid 2050s and then slowly pick up. So rural California, where those 12 counties act as kind of a microcosm of rural California, has lost population and probably won't quite recover it back for some time, but doesn't look like it's going to lose much more than the current level. And Sacramento, in contrast, looks like it's going to continue to grow, even though it has lost some population. It should come back by the end of this decade and then just burgeon along. And Sacramento is seen as one of the major growth areas of California. So this these data, when they came out, really provided, in my mind, a contrasting look at different ways to think about what's going to happen in California over the next 40 years. And that then 
sort of brings us to what's happening this year in terms of wrapping up. So our national labor markets are continuing to provide a lot of resilience, which is good. And that's the one reason why there's so much optimism about getting through the post-pandemic period without having a second recession. When interest rate relief comes, it's likely to be slow. You should not expect the Federal Reserve to be as aggressive downward as they were upward. But when it comes, it'll be intriguing to watch and see how housing demand, how credit availability, how the market for deposits and how the market for uh, how the market in terms of how banks survive and their profitability, we're watching that very closely. We should expect a relatively flat year in housing, even if interest rates fall. But if interest rates fall precipitously, we may actually see a little bit of a pickup in the late summer. And that'll be in, in, intriguing to watch in terms of that calculus in the Federal Reserve and how much more pressure they put on housing prices to rise. But if you're a renter, housing market's probably going to get a little bit better than worse, and it's just going to push it out even further. And that's sort of the nasty opportunity cost of rising home prices if you're a renter or you're concerned about people being able to move from rental to home ownership. That's going to get further and further away, especially once rates start to fall. So the things economists are watching and just sort of headwinds, tailwinds, and just vectors that might change what the, the things I told you today, elections and a lot of uncertainty in the United States. This is exacerbated potentially by geopolitical issues around the world, not only the Middle East, but what may also continue to happen in Ukraine, is, especially once the, the ground uh, goes from frozen tundra to mud to solid ground, and then whatever's going to happen campaign-wise on both sides, it's just going to get weird. And this, this it, what will happen in the United States in, during uh, an election year for president is going to be even more uncertainty. There's going to be that continued pinch, even with lower unemployment, or sorry, lower inflation rates, small businesses and lower to middle income households still have a cost pinch. And watch commercial real estate lending and deposit. Those, those coming together, there's a lot of Decent news on the commercial real estate front, especially if companies are going to start bringing workers back and that demand will, will pick back up for space. But there's going to be a lot of fallow space as well. So we got about two or three years of a lot of uncertainty in commercial real estate, which can lead to some uncertainty in lending and banking markets, especially because banks right now, banks, credit unions and savings banks are all sort of chasing deposits in the current environment. So folks, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. I think we have one question in the Q&A. Uh, it comes from Doug. It says, high inflation cost prices to increase about 20% and now prices are still high, and but not increasing as rapidly. Inflation may be declining, but overall prices have stayed high and are going higher, in in his opinion. So lower inflation is good, but families are paying a great deal more for food and gas. Uh, and is, am I looking at this from the wrong angle? And the answer is, Doug, no, you are not. The point of the, of the lower inflation is that pressure is receding. It does not mean you have not had this sort of compounding effect. And that's why I said this at the very end, that even with lower inflation, smaller businesses who tend to have um, inflation of with our cost structure as a regressive tax, just like lower to middle income households, you're not looking at it wrong. All it's doing is relieving that rising pressure, not relieving the core problem that's existed over the last three years as prices have gone up. So it'll be very intriguing to watch whether or not we see more people push toward the edge, which means less consumption because you can't afford to do it. And what that might mean for delinquencies on loans, delinquencies on credit cards, delinquencies on auto loans, and how that can start to spread its wings throughout lending, where banks, credit unions, and savings banks might be more reticent to lend toward businesses because they have other risks on their portfolio or in their portfolio that they don't know what's going to happen and they don't want to take more risk. That'll be the tricky part of how we get through the next few few months and years. Uh, thank you for that, that uh, question, Doug. Daryl asks, what's the impact of higher minimum wages on in the economy and inflation? The easiest way to explain it, Daryl, is this, is that it does help people who are at that minimum wage get a little bit more upward pressure on what they're being paid. It is a regressive tax on small business. And so it could mean there's a little bit less hiring. It really depends on how so-called effective that minimum wage is on the local market. For rural California, the minimum wage tends to be a little bit more effective or have an immediate market effect than in urban more uh, high paying and high wage level California, think again, our urban areas. But certainly for rural and small suburban California, that change can have an immediate impact, positive for the household, marginally negative, especially for smaller businesses in terms of what they're now seeing as higher cost structure. Uh, Vicki, I believe that that is it. Folks, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Eiler. And just a reminder, the a recording of this presentation and the slides
will be available later today, maybe tomorrow morning on the chavenconcepts.com. Thank you all.